But you're here. The taxi leaves, we'll see where you are, and then you start to walk in. And then let's just imagine if you started talking, say about here. Let's see what that would do for us. Okay. Tom, why don't you be on this side? Okay. Every so often, you get involved in a project, and you just kind of know that it's a big, huge personal adventure that you're about to undertake. Certainly that was the case with Da Vinci Code. And action! I'm sorry? But the priory, do you think that's why Sonia sought you out? The French government has been outspoken about wanting to encourage filming. And of course, Paris is a very, very complicated city to film in. And, you know, French bureaucracy can be complex. But they were really true to their word. They really helped simplify things for us. There was a real eagerness for us to be there and a great deal of cooperation. And uh, Brian Grazer and I had a wonderful 25, 30 minute meeting with President Chirac. Uh, where he basically was just welcoming us and, and saying that you know, if you really need any help, um, let us know. We may or may not be able to help, but we will try. And we really didn't need to call upon them. It was wonderful knowing that they were supportive and in our corner. But the fact is, people did everything they could to help us get the shots we needed in Paris. And Paris was you know, exciting to film in. We were all over that city. It was just great. And, you know, I'd, I'd never spent more than two or three days at a time in Paris. And suddenly I felt like I understood the city in ways I never would have had I not been shooting until dawn, uh, and, and, you know, out in front of the Louvre uh, and, and, you know, in, in, in other places in the city. And seeing the city sort of go to sleep very late at night and, and begin to wake up early in the morning, it was just, you know, fascinating. Uh, the Louvre began as a fortress and then it was demolished uh -huh. and it was rebuilt as a palace. Stop now. Tell me what it is. Clearly, the first crucial sequence in the movie is in the Louvre. Uh, it was so important to me that we'd be able to shoot there. I knew that we wouldn't be able to shoot every scene there you know, for, because you, know, you couldn't threaten the artwork there. and. and tie up the museum, but I knew it was important that we, that we shoot there. And in the back of my mind was a life experience that I wanted to have. You know, it was one of the reasons I wanted to make the movie, was that I wanted to be able to say I was one of those rare people that got to shoot inside the Louvre. It just about never, ever happens. But after a lot of discussion, breaking down the shots that we would absolutely need to be in the Louvre for versus the pickups and the close-ups and the things like that, that that we, could, that we could do on a set. Um, after a fairly lengthy negotiation, we, we wound up shooting uh, a number of nights in front of the Louvre and inside the Louvre. And um, here's what's amazing. When you're directing and you've got your shot list and you're looking at your watch, you know, suddenly you actually have to kick yourself because you're walking by these great works of art and, and you're looking at your shot list instead of looking at the art. But I guess we all, you know, we all have a job to do. And uh, once we were underway, you know, I had to make the movie The Da Vinci Code, not uh, you know, appreciate uh, the masterworks that I was uh, standing next to. But not an hour went by where I didn't just grab a moment for myself alone with a great painting. But there were very strict limitations as to how we could light the work and Salvatore Tortino had to work around these limitations and I think what resulted was in fact a really inspired, creative, atmospheric look. I'm a very big uh, Renaissance art fan. So I was a kid in a candy store. Anytime I, I got into the Louvre like in prep and they were closed and we were scouting, I took advantage of going up to every painting and and be able to be that close without being interrupted by anybody. No tourists, nobody. I mean, you know, I'm three feet from the Mona Lisa without one person in front of me. You never get that opportunity, you know, and, or, you know, any of the other paintings. So I was really excited about it. 
really you could only shoot from 11 at night to about 5 in the morning and then you had to get out of there and clean up like nothing had ever happened so that the Louvre could be in full operation to the public. I had never been in the Louvre after hours wandering looking at paintings with flashlights. Uh, that's, you know, all alone. That's not an experience I had had. It was as though I was a character in the book that I'd written. It was, it was uh, e even more surreal. And certainly to see, uh, to see Silas running about in, in the halls of the Louvre, uh, that, was, that was interesting as well. There is something about the, the, the power of the, of the physical scope when you're in the room all by yourself, or you're in the Louvre all by yourself. Uh, it's kind of like being in a football stadium all by yourself. Suddenly you think, wow, this is a really big place, and I have it all to myself. This is very cool and special. It, it, it really felt like we were on an adventure. It was, a, it was a, certainly a rarefied experience. And we very quietly went about our work. Cameras were set up. A couple of lights were placed in certain pla in certain spots and so forth. You know, I mean, it was a sort of an out-of-body experience, and we all felt it to varying degrees. This, this was the thing that everybody had been anticipating from the very beginning, and I think we're all disappointed that it only lasted four nights. It's a good place to come to work every day. The commute's not bad, you know, through the streets of Paris to get here in the first place. Uh, but to be here actually up in the uh, salons, you notice it was very hushed, almost like shooting in a church, very respectful. and. Uh, well, sometimes movies are uh, life experiences. You know? <laughs> this is, uh, I think this is definitely it for everybody. I, I, I'm going to assume it is for the French crew as well. We shot not only in Paris, but also uh, outside uh, Chateau Vallette, that area. And then we shot all over England. We shot all over Scotland. We went to Malta, shot a lot of the, uh, the biblical flashbacks and that stuff there, which was an amazing experience. And in each case, you don't just show up on the day with a camera and get out of the truck. There's you know weeks and sometimes months of preparation in each of those locations and how that's gonna work. And again, how the sort of leapfrog pattern works so that you can jump in and jump out of these locations, uh, losing as little time as possible. The Temple Church, right in the heart of London, was an amazing place to film. It really did feel like you were stepping into another century every time you walked through that door. And um, even though we were filming and had equipment and things like that there, it just kind of felt like you were in a time machine. It was, uh, it was, it was, you know, incredible. We shot out in front of Westminster Abbey. Um, you know, that was, that was an amazing day that I'll never forget mostly because we had just this limited window in which the city would allow us to be there. We had to accomplish a great deal of work. Also the nature of the scene that we were shooting, and it's kind of a part of the climax of the story. Um, but I also will never forget the hordes of onlookers who were there that we weren't allowed to, you know, control or partition off or get out of our frame, and so we had to devise a way so that we could just shoot with them there. And I thought, well, this is going to be a disaster. We're never going to get the sound. They're going to ruin all the shots. We're going to have to be in there CGing people out of that frame. And you know what? We asked the cooperation of, these, of the, the, this crowd, and they gave it to us. Uh, you know, it was raining a little bit, but not enough so that we could film it. And so we asked them, even though they were getting rained on for a certain take, to, if they'd take their umbrellas down. They all did. No flash photography, please, during the scene. No flash photography. Please no yelling or overlapping the dialogue now. They were right there applauding the actors when the takes were over. You know, uh, the British good manners really came into play that day. But some of the real surprises on the movie were some of the locations that weren't so glamorous and high profile. We were not given permission to shoot inside Westminster Abbey, but in Lincoln, there is virtually a sister cathedral built at the same time, probably by the same architects, I'm told. And the two cathedrals are quite similar. And with just a little bit of adapting, we were able to gain access to the inside of, of, of Lincoln Cathedral, uh, which is off the beaten path, doesn't have quite as much tourism, um, and uh, you know, use that for the inside of Westminster Abbey. Turned out to be a, you know, a great week spent in Lincoln.
but I had to recreate Westminster Abbey in another cathedral. And we explored a lot of cathedrals in England and eventually decided that Lincoln was architecturally most similar to Westminster. So we recreated the whole of the, the Newton's tomb and the screen that Newton's tomb is in and various other tombs, the unknown warrior's tomb, etc., etc., and recreated Westminster Abbey. Well, the location is a cathedral that was started, I believe, in 1088 and uh, added on to every couple hundred years or so. And the end result is, well, as a spectacular place as you can imagine, uh, even better that it's off, relatively off the beaten path. It's a very impressive way to spend the day. You don't want to be back, uh, too, you don't want to spend too much time at the tea table on this one. You want to get back inside and, and take, in, uh, take in the sights. Without a doubt, it helps us, it helps me, I won't speak for the others, but it helps me as an actor, just get a little bit beyond the pretend aspect of uh, playing, you know, Robert Langdon. It's different than saying driving to uh, Culver City every day and going on to stage six in order to in order to shoot this stuff. Lincoln was fantastic. They were extremely excited to have us, and they were willing to work with us. You know, they never experienced anything like that. And the control, of, you know, the weather in England is. It's sunny now, and five minutes from now it's hailing, and then it's raining, and it's bright sunny again, or it's gray, cloudy all day long. So we needed to control the lighting in the cathedral. And our gaffer, Perry Evans, and his rigging crew came up with a series of plugs for the very high windows. And for the lower windows, a series of curtains. From the outside, they were able to roll the curtains up or lower them so I could light through certain windows at certain times. So it gave me a lot of freedom, and the church's willingness to help was really exciting because I, we were able to create something that you don't normally get a chance to do. Sonia said he was the most honorable man here in the room. We are for protect, I think. You want to be back down with me? Uh, no, no, it's okay. Okay, good. Let's mark him there, please. Found Edinburgh to be a very cool place to visit and film. And Roslyn Chapel was truly magical. You've got your uh, 13th century ruins, 1622 house, chapel up the road, ancient uh, bridge, trees turning color before our very eyes, skies providing us with both the clouds we need and the sun that we'll deal with when the time comes. Only a movie company would be complaining about weather like this. Uh, you know, why, we want clouds on the day that we're getting beautiful sun in Scotland. But, uh, but nonetheless, we just shot a, a, a great scene. And um, the chapel is a kind of a mind-blowing example of Masonic craftsmanship, culture, historical um, and, and religious significance. It's really an intriguing place. One of the great thrills for me in writing the book was being able to incorporate this church, which for me uh, has always been a special place. I've known about this church for a long time and, and is still here in, in almost its original condition. It has lots and lots of mystery built into it. Some believe it's the Bible in stone. Some believe the Holy Grail is buried in the chamber underneath. Many, many stories. Christian. Well, we know where the Opus Dei houses are in England and Paris, and we actually went to look at the exterior, and from that sort of guess what the interior would look like. Once you have the exterior of a house, you can make up what the interior looks like. Based on the proportions of windows, you've obviously got the window on the exterior, so you know what the windows look like, and you can guess the proportions of the rooms from that. You can look at the chimneys and guess where the fireplaces are. So you can have a reasonably accurate reproduction of what the room might be like. And then we're using Burley House as Castle Gandolfo in, in Italy, and that's pretty rich. And we like the wall paintings. There's a heaven room and a hell staircase, and we like the sort of look at that. It is it is grander and more opulent, and again to reflect, as you say, that sort of Catholic Rome look. And I think it will contrast with with the look of Lincoln Cathedral with Westminster Abbey. But that, that's an important visual element of the movie, I think. Supposedly the invasion was to find an artifact. And then there's the attack on Jerusalem in the 11th century, and then we go forward to 200 years. So the, the actual Crusades and the Templar Knights, I think it was 1307 when, when they were hounded and, and tortured and burnt to death. So there's quite a long period 
of 200 years between the flashbacks, which was also pretty interesting from my point of view. So we're recreating the attack on Jerusalem, and then we're recreating the, the Templars being captured and tortured and burnt at the stake. But we're using the computer a lot, and we're shooting in a quarry, which I've used before in Leighton Buzzard, because it's, it's, it looks a bit like the Middle East, and we could make it to southern France, where we imagine the Templars were actually rounded up. I was talking to, to Tom Hanks earlier, and I said, you know, someday, with digital technology being what it is, films may stop going on location. It may, it may just be too impractical or inefficient, given what you can do on a soundstage with digital effects and, and, and the creation of a virtual world. And I'm glad that I'm making films in the era where you go on a voyage to make a movie. And uh, Da Vinci Code has definitely provided me one of those sort of experiences. Cut. Very good. That's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic.